In this lecture, we're going to cover both chapter 6 and 18. So let's look at proteins and amino acids. You've had a lot of this material in biology, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the introductory slides, but if it's a little bit dusty, be sure to read thoroughly in your textbook. Proteins are made of amino acids. Some of them are non-essential and some are essential. You do not have to know the names of each group for this test, but you should take a look at the structure of the amino acid and understand the importance of the side chain. Because with amino acids, the sequence of amino acid, because of the side group, establishes the structure which establishes the function. The, so the final function are of the amino acid is determined by the shape, which is determined by the sequence of amino acids. Sickle cell disease is a disease in which the importance of that sequence becomes extremely apparent. Click into this link to see a very brief video on sickle cell disease. In sickle cell disease, there is one error in the amino acid sequencing for hemoglobin. And because of that, and the way the hemoglobin lines up, especially under low oxygen conditions, the red blood cell is sickle-shaped instead of disc-shaped. This can cause pain and disability and uh, tissue damage because these sickle-shaped red blood cells get stuck in capillaries and don't carry oxygen well, etc. Protein denaturation is described in this video link. Please take a listen to this video. It is very important that you understand what denaturation is. Denaturation actually um, breaks down that protein to its chain-like structure and therefore changes the nature of that protein, but also as a part of digestion, denaturation occurs in the stomach because of acid. As a part of digestion, this is essential because denaturation allows that protein then to be completely broken down to the amino acids. Our bodies need amino acids as the end product of digestion. Digestion of proteins, begins in the stomach, the chemical digestion, and that is because acid is present as well as an enzyme that begins the breakdown of protein. Protein digestion is completed in the small intestine, and you can read the steps of that in this slide and animation in your textbook. When protein digestion is incomplete, and a whole protein passes through the digestive tract, food allergies can be triggered. Food allergies are not uncommon, but they are often assumed to be a bit more common than they are. It's very important that if you suspect a food allergy that you see a physician in that specialty so he can run or she can run the proper tests. Okay. Important slide, important slide even though it does not look like much because we need to understand what happens to dietary proteins and this slide tells it all. So dietary proteins, as we just established, are broken down to amino acids. And because there is no storage of protein, and I will repeat this again, extra protein is not stored. There's no place to store protein. We call the amino acids that are present the amino acid pool. Now, if you have enough calories, the amino acids will be used to synthesize the proteins that your body needs. And we'll look at that in just a minute. Okay, so body proteins is one thing that can happen to dietary proteins. But remember again, you don't take the dietary protein, milk protein, and put it into your muscles. You break the dietary protein down to amino acids and they are then reconnected according to your DNA to build your body proteins. Now, if you don't have enough energy and you need amino acids for energy, 
that's what they will become. If you have plenty of protein and plenty of energy, your extra amino acids will turn into fat. And that's really important to understand. Extra amino acids become fat, not body protein. You can take a look and review the process here. And important to understand, you pull from your amino acid pool to make your body's proteins. When an amino acid, because of an inadequate diet, is not available, then protein synthesis stops. That amino acid is called the limiting amino acid. And that can occur because of very, very unbalanced diets. As I mentioned, amino acids can be used for energy. It is not what you want to happen to your amino acids. It's preferable that they're built into body proteins, but energy is a top priority for the body. If you are on a very, very low calorie diet, you will not only break down your dietary proteins for fuel, you will break down your body's proteins for fuel as well. This is a great, though busy slide that discusses all of the different protein um, roles in the body. So be sure to read through every single block here. Protein is important not only for our muscles and our hair and our nails. Protein does far more things such as maintains fluid balance. Proteins keep your immune system strong. When you are on a protein deficient diet, one of the things that happens is you can lose your hair and you can start becoming sick more often. Protein is important for your skin as collagen. It's important for healing as well, for hormones. So be absolutely certain to read through all of the roles of protein in the body. Now, I did say we were going to cover chapter 18 in this lecture. You can skim chapter 18. I don't usually tell you to skim chapters, but this one is covered rather briefly on the exam. Now, the quiz questions cover the entire chapter, so you do need to read it, but you can give it a quicker read. It's not unimportant information. We have a global community now that suffers from malnutrition, some from undernutrition, some from overconsumption, and both can have a tremendously negative health impact on the human body. One of the things that we see happening as countries become wealthier, as the middle class is built, is that a diet that was once inadequate, a dietary pattern, be moves very, very quickly into a diet where there's an overabundance of substances that um, take a toll on our health. So unfortunately, more money does not bring people into the great diet that we'd like people to be following, uh, plant-based fruits, vegetables, whole grains. What happens is the diet becomes more Western and the Western diet is high in fat, high in sugar, high in fiber. So there is uh, an explanation through these tr nutrition transitions of why we see this, um, you know, two sides of malnutrition, undernourished and overnourished. With the overconsumption of the Western-like diet, we see a rise in non-communicable or what used to be called chronic diseases. You know, undernutrition has a, a toll as well. When there is severe undernutrition, we see the impact of this through the entire life cycle and into the next generation. So why? Why is there hunger and undernutrition in the world? Many, many different reasons. And you can read about them in your textbook. Some have to do with politics. Some have to do with culture. Many have to do with food shortages and poverty. Poverty is at the base of many of these problems. You will have test questions on Merasmus and Kwashiorkor, two types of protein energy malnutrition. Merasmus is 
a type of energy and protein deprivation where you see severe wasting and an impact on not only subcutaneous fat but a wasting away of vital organs and tissues in kwashiorkor there's often enough calories but a, a severe shortage of protein and because of that you see a bloated abdomen due to fluid retention and um, an enlarged liver and you don't see the severe wasting, but this is a very serious disease. Although you're seeing pictures of children in this slide, these diseases do occur in adults. Marasmus quite often, Kwashiorkor less so because of the reserves that an adult has compared to a child. There are ways to eliminate world hunger, and you can read about that in your textbook. There certainly are quite a few agencies that are attempting to do so. Sustainable agriculture, as well as choices, has a lot to do with this. Um, instead of sending you know, big bags of corn and soy, enabling communities to grow and um, raise their own food becomes very, very important. Now in the United States, we don't see the severity of malnutrition or undernutrition that we do see in other countries, but we do see what's called food insecurity and the rates of food insecurity are rising uh, due to the pandemic. Food insecurity is described as not having certainty that you will be able to have food um, for the next meal or the next day. So there's a lot of uncertainty about that. And it's much more common in this country than many people know. Some of this occurs in food deserts, and I will tell you there are both urban and rural food deserts. This shows you the agricultural workers who get paid extremely poorly, and often, though they work in fields doing backbreaking work, don't have access to the good food that they you know, provide for us. Um, however, there are also rural food deserts that affect individuals who live in rural areas without ready access to a market that sells healthy food. Read through the, the cycle of poverty and be sure to understand that poverty as is at the root of both food insecurity and undernutrition. Now, in our country, we also have another problem, and that is we consume loads of protein. This is probably more common than inadequate protein. We have prided ourselves on big steaks and huge slabs of chicken and pork. Um, this brings a number of health problems and environmental problems as well. But as far as the health problems, if you get too much protein, of course, extra protein builds body fat. It can be rough on your kidneys because when amino acids are broken down for energy, deamination occurs and you need to get rid of that nitrogenous part of the amino acid and that occurs through the kidneys. You also need plenty of fluid so that dehydration doesn't occur as you do um, excrete the nitrogen end of the amino acid. We see bone health issues in those who consume a lot of protein. And of course, if you're consuming protein like this young man is, you're getting a lot of saturated fat, which is problematic as well. Now, there are a couple of other conditions where people are harmed by certain amino acids. Phenylketonuria is an inherited disease, and phenylalanine is the amino acid that causes a problem. There's a link if you want to learn more here. There are also individuals that report anecdotally reactions to monosodium glutamate, sometimes called MSG symptom complex or the Chinese restaurant syndrome. You must know how protein requirements are determined. Now the numbers here are for an individual who is not growing, who is not building, who is not healing, and they are determined a couple of different ways and your eye profile does the same. You can base your requirement on your body weight and to do that you convert 
your pounds to kilograms, you divide by 2.2, and then multiply your kilograms by 0.8. So practice doing that at home because that is on a test question. You can also determine it as a percentage of calories provided. That's the AMDR, and it should be between 10 and 35%. But remember, this 0.8 covers only a, a certain subset of adults. Protein needs increase during growth, pregnancy, lactation, and now we're increasing needs during the elder years as well. Protein in a variety of foods, you can Eat a meat-free diet and get plenty of protein. It just takes a bit more planning, but you can see here that protein is found in a large number of foods. You'll take a look at these when you look at your slide set. I wanted to mention what protein quality is. Protein, a high quality protein, sometimes called a complete protein, has the right mix of amino acids to keep your, cell, your protein making machinery going. Good mix of those essential amino acids. And typically the animal derived foods are high in protein along with a couple of plant products and you can see that here in the soy and the quinoa. So soy, quinoa, beef, chicken, eggs, milk, um, fish are considered high quality protein. High quality proteins not only have a good mix of amino acids, but also are very bioavailable. You absorb the protein without much difficulty. Read through this chart. Protein needs based on body weight do change throughout our life cycle. And I'm gonna quickly describe nitrogen balance, but this is included in your textbook. Nitrogen balance is a study that can be run to determine what your body is doing with the protein that you're consuming. So when you consume the amount of protein that your body needs and you are not building, repairing, um, you're in a kind of a, a balance you are in nitrogen balance. So nitrogen in equals nitrogen out and total body protein does not change. So most of us are in nitrogen balance as adults. If you're building body protein, what happens is the nitrogen that, that's going in is more than the nitrogen that is excreted and that's because you're building body protein from those amino acids. Okay, that's called a positive nitrogen balance. And if you're breaking down your body protein, you're in a catabolic state. That is called negative nitrogen balance and you'll see more nitrogen in your urine than is consumed. There's one test question on this, so this is worth a review. In most cases, we do not need protein and amino acid supplements. There are rare exceptions to this rule a lot of individuals who work out quite hard or are you know, semi-professional or professional athletes trying to make sure they repair any muscle breakdown take whey protein and whey protein is a very high quality protein that works well for those individuals. Some older people eat a whey or drink a whey protein shake as well. Be sure to read How to Choose Protein Wisely. Um, one of the questions on your homework asks you about your protein source, and that's important. You can get high quality protein from a lot of different places, but you do need to understand that the protein comes with other substances that may help or harm our health. Click into this link, please. And lastly, we're gonna talk quickly about vegetarianism. So a vegan is a vegetarian who doesn't consume any animal derived products. No milk, no eggs, no meat, and often no medication or cosmetics that have an animal source of any type. But there are lots of different types of vegetarians. Those who consume milk, those that consume eggs, those that consume milk and eggs. 
The reasons for choosing vegetarianism are many. A lot of individuals choose vegetarianism for health at for health reasons, and we'll see that that is well based in science, um, and also for concerns about animal welfare or the environment as well. We know that vegetarians who plan a healthy vegetarian diet do quite well in terms of decreasing their risk for a number of diseases and increasing longevity. It's an extremely healthy diet when you plan it well. When it isn't planned well, it can be very unhealthy. If you eat all processed foods, if you eat loads of cheese with saturated fat, if you don't get the variety of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and nuts and seeds that you need, that can be a problem. Vegetarianism, when planned well, can support even the most elite of athletes like Carl Lewis, the Olympian. Now in the days past, we used to teach vegetarianism by talking about complementary foods, complementary proteins. The way this works is rice and beans are both incomplete. They have a limiting amino acid or more. But when you combine them together, you get a complete protein. What's missing in the beans is found in the rice and vice versa. The same can be said for all of these foods. We still acknowledge the importance of variety and getting all of the essential amino acids you need through these different foods. But now we talk more in terms of making sure that you have these matches during the day. It doesn't have to be at the same meal necessarily. Be sure to read through this. This is the strictest vegetarian diet and there are nutrients of concern, but that doesn't mean they don't have sources. And you can see here, there are plenty of sources for each of them. And if you have a minute, take a, a challenge and plan a meat-free diet. Um, there's a couple of sites out there. One is uh, Meatless Mondays. We don't have to become vegetarians in order to push toward a plant-based diet and reap a lot of the health benefits. So if we can go a couple of days without meat or animal-derived foods, our health will benefit.